start with a question. Questions like this. <clears throat> when, we, if you, when you look at Eishas Chayel, which is what we sing Friday night, right? Uh, in Eishas Chayel, um, it says, it describes all the, 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 the attributes of this Eishas Chayel, this woman of valor, valor, right? And it says, Vatishak liyom acharon. She laughs at the last day. The last day, meaning the last day of life. She laughs at death. Yom Acher, on the last day of your life, right? The day someone's going to die, this doesn't make her nervous at all. As a matter of fact, not only is she sad at the concept of someone dying, but tishak, she laughs at this whole concept of death. But tishak, we Yom Acher. So, our questions, we have three questions on that. Number one, why is she laughing at death? Death is not funny. Death is not happy. Death is seemingly <coughs> sad. Why is she vatishak? She's laughing, schok, right? Why is she laughing at death? Why is it specifically seemingly the Aishas Chayel? It seems that, again, it's listing attributes specifically of this woman of valor, right? So why specifically um, is, what, what, what's it about women and this Aishas Chayel that gives her the ability to laugh at death? And what does it have to do with Friday night? Why are we seeing this Friday night? Yeah, well, that's we're eating a meal together, so you're all together. Okay, but theoretically, you should be eating all your meals together, all right? So why, why, what, what, what connection does this have to specifically uh, Friday night, uh, right before we make Kiddush and Hamotzi? So why is she laughing at the day of death? Why is it specifically this Aishas Chayel? Uh, laughing at the de- laughing at death, and what's the connection to uh, Friday night as a prelude right before we make Kiddush and make Hamotzi? Kvaltik. So what is schok, tzichok, or schok, laughter, right? When we laugh at something, laughter is always, um, what, what, what's funny? S- funny is when something goes, mamish, the opposite of what you would think. Where do we find laughter in the, in the Chumash? Well, Yitzchak, the very first Jewish child to be born, Abraham calls him Yitzchak from the word schok, laughter, kalashomeya yitzchakli. Whoever hears that I, who was 100 years old, and my wife was 90 years old, whoever hears that I had a baby is going to laugh. Why do you laugh? Because it's like 100 years old. You don't expect it. It's like, whoop, out of the ordinary. <laughs> and you laugh because that's, that just, just wasn't expected, just sort of caught you by surprise. Right? Same as the Marina Full Hirsch says that's exactly the whole concept of the Jewish people. The first child born was called Yitzhak. Why did God wait that Abraham should be so old and everyone should laugh at it? Symbolic of the survival of the Jewish people. Jewish people consistently, just when everyone thinks we're gone, just like Abraham, he's a nice guy, monotheism, but he's a hundred, the whole show's over, it's gonna die with him. Surprisingly, laughingly, he has a kid. That's the symbol of the entire history of the Jewish people. Just whatever and things were gone. Bam, there we are again. But schok is, is laughter. It's, that, that's what a choke is all about. Um, I j- just spoke about this in a Shabbat a little while ago. And since this is Sharet Fila, I must give Kedem Rekadu, I, I, I use an example. So I'll give you an example of one of my favorite, my favorite, you know, funny lines of, like, shh, like, out of nowhere. And it's actually, I heard this from Rabbi Lipner. He used it once, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, but, um, uh, I've used it consistently. It's all in the telling, right? Uh, but he, he tells the story, the story of the guy, these three guys that are on the way up to heaven, right? There's an Italian, a Frenchman, and a Jewish guy. And they get up to heaven, and they're being judged. And the Frenchman goes first, and he sees while laid out in front of him this big, beautiful meal with, like, French croissants and wines and cheeses. Unbelievable. And he said, that's for me? And the good Lord says, well, you know, you really don't deserve it. He said, yeah, I know. He said, but here's the deal. The meal starts at 5 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, we're going to throw you into a boiling hot vat of French onion soup. You live through that, and you're going to be in there for a minute. You live through that, you're going to have the meal. Oh, no, man, I can't do that. Okay, calls in the Italian guy. The Italian guy says, it's a beautiful meal. Why do this pasta is there? It's unbelievable. And he says, wow, this is all for me? And he goes, well, you know, you know, he says, yeah, yeah, okay, so what's it? I says, well, we're going to throw you in at 5 o'clock exactly. You get thrown to a boiling hot vat of minestrone soup. You live through that, you get the meal. And he said, nah, I can't do that. Next comes in a Jewish guy. He sits there, it's unbelievable. There's shalt and there's kugel and there's kishka and there's four types of herring and there's single malt scotch. It's like just everything you can, cockish cake, right? It's all there. And he says, okay, very funny. I don't deserve it. What's the deal, right? So the good Lord says, well, listen, here's the deal. At exactly five o'clock, you're going to be thrown into a boiling hot vat of chicken soup. You live through that, you can have it. He says, fine, no problem. And the other guy say, what are you doing? Well, a boiling hot vat of chicken soup. You're not going to make it. He said, I've been to these things before. First of all, five o'clock is never five o'clock. <laughs> Second of all, the soup's never hot. <laughs> <laughs> 
aside to use that for many people attitude on Judaism, like you just want to get away with a minimum, and if you can just wiggle your way out of it, you'll, you'll pull it off and you'll be okay. But it's a joke, because it's not what you expect. Laughter is not what you expect. They asked the Rambam, they asked Maimonides, is there any way we can see within this world any hint or allusion to the concept of Tchias HaMais in the resurrection of the dead? We believe that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. The world exists for 6,000 years, for the 7,000th Shabbat, in the era of the Messiah, and then after that there'll be an era of Tchias HaMais, the resurrection of the dead, which whatever that means, Right? He says, is there any way, is there any allusion to that? Do we see any hint to that in, 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 in the world? Says the Ramam, yes, we do. We see that in the birth of a baby. Says Rabbi Tatz, Rabbi Dr. Akiva Tatz on that. He says, if you know anything about the birth of the baby, he said, uh, medically, he said they figured it out. There's 25 things that are wrong about this entire birth process. Meaning, there's 25 factors that the baby needs to stay alive in the womb, all of which would kill it if it would be outside. The baby has no lungs, the baby's underwater. The blood's going in the wrong direction, there's a hole in the heart. There's tons of things going on that it needs to survive in the womb, but it's the exact opposite of what it's going to need, it's going to need when it gets born. And when it gets born, what happens is it essentially dies because everything reverses instantaneously. The baby comes out, Bill Orr's clamp, and all of a sudden, lungs start opening up, which would have killed it inside the womb. The blood starts going the other way, and the hole in the heart closes up because the blood has to start circulating within the body, so the hole has to close up. The baby like is purple and can barely breathe, and then psh, everything switches, and it's reborn. It's the resurrection of the dead. Because the baby inside the room is actually dead outside. And when it comes outside, it's dead for a few milliseconds until everything flips, and then it's alive. And what is the mother giving birth to? She's screaming in pain, and she's in huge pain, and she's crying in pain as the birth process is happening. Baby comes out, and it's blue. Bam! Boom! Baby starts crying, and what does she do? She starts laughing. Because it's birth. She understands the concept that life is temporary, and that death leads to birth. When we die, our bodies are dying. Our souls are reborn in a better place. The Ibn Ezra asked the following question. This was actually asked to me. Uh, um, and the first says, like, we had to think all the question box. Where it's like a decorated shoe box. The kids could put in questions anonymously. We would open it up, we would answer the question. I opened it up once, it was ninth grade, grade nine, and there was a question there that says like this. If everything that God does is for the best, so when someone dies, why are we sad? It's for the best. Hey, my grandfather died. Yes, and it double, model double, model double, seven and double. It's for the best. Well, everything God does is for the best. Right? My little brother's got run over by a cement truck. Seven and double, model double, model double. Everything God does is for the best. Why are we sad? Why are we sitting shiva? Everything God does is for the best. So asked a kid. So I read the question. Of course, the girls were, <gasps> I said, it's an Ibn Ezra. The Ibn Ezra himself, a great commentary on the Chumash, a Spanish commentator on the Chumash, asked that very question. On the Pesach, Bani Amatem Hashem Elokechem, he asked that question. And he says like this, he gives a great mushal. He said, you have two best friends. They grow up in some little town in nowhere, right? And one's he's going to school and he's studying, but there's no positions like that in this little town. But he's studying away and he sends out his resumes. And like for years, he's studying and he's waiting and all of a sudden he gets the letter, bam! He got the job of his dreams exactly fitting what he's been training for, exactly it, out in the big city. You go to the train station to see him off. How do you feel? Would you tell him not to go? He's been training for this for his whole life. This is what he's been preparing for. This is the pinnacle. He's been waiting for this. It'll finally work. He got it. You tell him not to go? Chastashalb, you're happy for him. You're sad. You're going to miss him. It's going to be boring. It's going to be a little bit lonely. But you would never tell him not to go. It's the best thing that ever happened to him. The Nisham has been training for this on earth by doing good deeds. When it dies, so it finally gets the stupid body the heck out of the way, and it can go up to the world to come and reap its great rewards. So it is good. 
we're just lonely because I really like my father and he was a really nice guy and he was really very helpful and it's a little hard to manage without him. So I am sad for myself because my life's a little stinkier. But it really was the best thing that could have happened. I'm happy for him. Death is rebirth to something greater. Just like a baby being born is really a death with a rebirth to something greater. And therefore, the Aishas Chayim, the woman of valor, the women who understand this concept, by the very monthly cycle of blood dying, blood cells dying, and then regenerating so you can give birth again, that very concept, right, is part of what women can do unlike men. With women can emulate God, that's why they have more an intuitive uh, kedusha than men. We're not going to get into why they have less mitzvot. They don't need the structure because they have that intuitive sense, because they have that creative ability. But creative ability understands uh, in dying and getting rid of one stage to be able to move up and get to the next stage. It's the darkest before dawn, right? So the Ashes Chayel, who understands that birthing process, Vatishak Liom Acheron. She specifically can laugh at the day of death because she understands that our 120 years on earth, that death is really a rebirth for something greater. And why do we sing that Friday night? Because that's what Shabbos is all about. We're working six days, and then we climb into something greater because what do we gain on Shabbat? A neshama yaseira. You get an extra neshama on Shabbos. The Kabbalists tell us you get a, was that extra, well, it's a second neshama or yes, so you just gain a greater neshama. But your neshama is in a higher spiritual state of awareness because it's now Shabbat, Shabbat Kodesh. And all the toil and the work that you've been doing during these six days by the fact that you stop and say God controls the show gives that neshama an extra birth, a boost, and you are born with a, sort of reborn on Shabbat with a new, a greater, improved, extra neshama. That's why at the end of Shabbat we smell because we're going faint. That extra neshama is leaving and neshama is shrinking again. And we're, we're, we're going faint because we're losing that elevated status. So, to, just to, so we don't faint. We take some smelling salts to revive us and so we can work for another week and then go through that same process. So it's the Aishas Chayel who understands the concept of birth is really a death and a rebirth can understand that life is really just temporary and a greater rebirth, right? And therefore we we sing to her Fatishak Liom Achron and we do it Friday night, which is also a rebirth. But let's take it a little deeper, my friends. The whole the word emuna, faith, trustworthiness, right? To be Ma'amin, Emuna unlike bitachon, and we're not going to get into a, a, a nitty-gritty discussion between bitachon, which is trust in Hashem, and emunah, which is faithfulness to Hashem. But faith, emunah, faithfulness, is really, even when times are tough and things don't make sense, you are ne'emun, you are trustworthy, you stick to it. Emunah is lashon nekeva. Emunah is a feminine word. Vav hey ending, emunah. Emunah is a feminine word. Why is emunah a feminine word? Because emunah is specifically that faith, that ability to, through adversity, to, to see the light, that ability to realize that difficulties are just going to make you a better person, right? That ability to, to see through the external and grasp onto the value that is particularly a trait of women. What are we told? It was in the merit of righteous women that we got redeemed from Egypt. It's in the merit of righteous women that we'll have the future redemption. Ask of Shalom Shavadran. First of all, there's a few interesting uh, points to be made about that statement of the rabbis. First of all, it says, in 
uh, it was in the right in the merit of righteous women we got out of Egypt, and the merit of righteous women will be the future redemption. So it seems that there's a parallel between the exile and redemption of Egypt and the final exile and the final redemption. But there's many, many parallels. Uh, we were redeemed in the month of Nisan. We will be redeemed in the month of Nisan. The, 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 the Kabbalists are replete with parallels of our original exile and our original redemption back in Egypt and our final exile and final redemption. Tons of parallels. One of them is the merit of righteous women, merit of righteous women. As for Shadron, why specifically the merit of righteous women? It appears that whatever the problem was in the exile in Egypt, it was resolved by the righteous women specifically, and it would appear that in the final exile, we're going to have the same problem, and it also can only be, therefore, only be resolved by women. You hear the problem? You hear the issue? Right? There's a bell. The merit of righteous women redeemed from Egypt. That means whatever the issue was, it took righteous women to get us out of it. And in the merit of righteous women will be the final redemption, which means, obviously, in the end of days, it's going to be the same problem, and therefore we need the same solution. So what was the problem, and what does women have to do with it, and what's the solution? Says the Shalom of Shadron like this. What was the state of Jews in Egypt? Were they good guys? Were they bad guys? Were they messed up? Were they okay? Were they righteous? Were they wicked? So we have two contradictory statements of the rabbis. One is... They were on the 49th level of Tuma, 49th level, level of moral depravity, 49th level of, 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 of impurity. That's why we had to rush out. They had to eat the carbon Pesach you know, with their sticks and their shoes, ready to go. They had to be chased out one more minute, and they would have been down to the 50th level, level and unredeemable. Every kid knows that. 49th level of impurity, 49th level of immorality, 49th level of, of like uh, of tuma uh, and, and lack of sanctity, and therefore God had to rush them out. Gorshu, we were chased out of Egypt. We had to get out. We couldn't stay there one more second. On the other hand, the rabbis say, Loshinu Lashonam, Loshinu Malbusham, Loshinu Shmam. They did not change, pardon me, they did not change their clothing. They did not change their language. They did not change their names. They wore Jewish clothing. They had Jewish names. And they spoke a Jewish language. They spoke Hebrew, or maybe they spoke in a Jewish way. So as to update uh, Rav Shadron's um, uh, example, so you have a guy, Friday night, his name is Moshe, right? And he's wearing like a black hat, and he has like payas by the side of his ears, and he has a beard, right, and a long black coat. And he's sitting in a bar on Friday night singing karaoke, but in Yiddish. 49th level of impurity, but they had Jewish names, Jewish clothing, Jewish language, which means they walked the walk and talked the talk. They had the externals, they had the structure. But inside, they were completely off. Their internal values, internal sense of sanctity was off. But they had the externals. So Dr. Chadron, what's going on today? Walk the walk, talk the talk, we're lacking the insides. So we're all very Jewish, and we buy early bonds, and we all eat bagels and lox, and, you know, and, and we, we go to services, and, and we, do, we do our thing. But inside, are we, do we have real Jewish values? Are we connected to the divine? Or we're just paying lip service and doing what we got to do. And whatever level of religiosity you're at, right? The externals are all great and everything. We've got tons of kosher food and everyone can keep Shabbat. And we have a state of Israel. And we all go to the wall. And we all do stuff. And it's the dance. Really great. And tons of synagogues. And everyone's buying filling. And they, they, you got your stuff. But inside it, do we really have a connection? Or we just pull it out of our pocket because you need a religion. Because you, you got to get yourself bar mitzvahed, right? And then you put it back in your pocket when it gets in the way. Walk the walk, talk the talk, but we're missing the insights. That's what we're struggling with now. And what was it? It was the merit of righteous women. Why righteous women? Because women are compared to the Levana and men are compared to the Chaba. Women, Kabbalistically, are compared to the moon and men are compared to the sun. Levana, moon, from the word lave, heart. Chaba, sun, Cham, ha, hat, chama, son, from the word moach, brain. 
Now, that does not mean that women are brainless and men are heartless, right? But what it does mean is, is that the focus of women, their power is their heart, and the men, their power is the concept and the ideas. Just to illustrate that. Why, why are women, the Akira Sabai, they're the ones that are really uh, tasked, right? In a perfect world, women has the ability to do that. But in concept, they are tasked with the ones of raising the small children. That's really, that's, that's their greatest strength. The rabbi says, why? why? Why raising small children? Because you got a little kid who's about to touch the stove. And he shouldn't do that because he's going he's gonna to get burned. It's going to be really painful. It's a really bad idea. So what does a mother do? Grabs the kids and... Ah! By grabbing the kid, you're telling the kid you're doing something which is dangerous, but I'm not angry at you, but I love you, and now you're secure. And she doesn't have to say a thing. What does the father do? You shouldn't touch the stove. There's nerve endings at the end of your finger, which communicates pain to the brain, and it's dangerous. He gives them a speech, right? Kid takes their first step. The mother goes, yeah, and the kid sings something great. What does the father do? Walking is very important. It keeps you know, you know, things upright, and, right? Men give speeches. Women give hugs, right? <laughs> It, you've never had this all married couples. You've never had this following in the conversation in your home? <clears throat> um, dear, are, 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 are you upset with me? Well, it's about time you noticed. Uh, well, you, you didn't say anything. Do I have to say something? Yes, for men you do. You have to say something, right? But women sense it and smell it, right? Absolutely. Women are the lathe. When you're dealing in a situation where you're walking the walk and talking and talking, you got the externals and you have the you know the Jewish politicians and you got a Jewish state and you got Jewish clothing and you got Jewish food and everything is kosher and Shabbat is not a problem and everything is fine. When you got all the externals, but there's no heart, there's no connection, there's no meaning. You don't need more brain. You need more heart. You need a muna. You need trustworthiness. You need a connection. That's what the women contributed. That was Egypt, and that's our final exile. Our final exile is the exile of walking the walk, talking the talk. We have everything available to us, but there's no passion, there's no excitement, there's no connection. We're struggling with it, and we just checkbook Judaism, and, 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 and we're yites and we fulfill our obligation, and, but, but, but we don't, we, we're, 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 our, our hearts are, are, are not connected to, to the divine, right? And, and, and uh, that's the concept of Eshes Chayel, Fatisach Yom Achrod, Emuna, belief, faith, a real belief, real connection, that what we see, the material, there's, 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 there's sanctity with inside of it. There's meaning with inside of it. The body dies, it goes on to something greater. The six-day work week gives birth to Shabbat, which has a, an, extra neshama, an extra neshama to it. That's the power of the Eishas Chayel. And that's why Shabbos is called Shabbos HaMalka, the Sabbath queen. It has that feminine aspect to it because the purpose of Shabbat is to put faith, belief. God created the world. The material world is not an end. The material world is just a means to sanctify it and, and, and put our imprint on it. It doesn't define us because women don't define themselves by stuff. Women define themselves by connections and emotions and feeling. Men define themselves by stuff. I am a lawyer and I drive this car. And this is my office and this is the watch I wear. Men struggle with that more. Not that women don't have the ability to be superficial, doesn't mean that men don't have the ability to be internal. But, but the default of what we struggle with, right, that's what we struggle with. Women are so good at connections and emotions and feelings and sensing things. And men are picture and structure, right? When a woman has a problem, she says, you know, the house, it really needs a paint job, and it's just so dirty. What does the husband do? Okay, I'm going to call a painter. She didn't necessarily, she didn't mean you to paint the house. She understands you don't have the money necessarily to paint the house. She's just talking. She's just talking that, you know, the house needs a paint job, and it's really bothersome. And all she wanted to say was, yeah, you know, the house needs a paint job. You know, Mr. Jim, maybe someday we'll have the money for it. Let's, you know, I, I feel very, I know it's really bothersome. That's all she wanted. She didn't want you to get on the phone and say, and say okay, I'll call the painter and then go back to your newspaper. That's not what she was looking for. She was looking for a connection and a feeling and a sense, right? Where as men, I don't want, I just want, I just want a clean shirt. I don't want any clean shirts. Oh, that's very difficult. I just want a shirt. I don't want it. I don't want it. I just want a shirt, okay, right? 
That's the struggle between the two. So we start with Eishev Chayel. And what do we do after Eishev Chayel? We make Kiddush on wine and we make a mozi on bread. Bread. Lechem. A mozi lechem min ha'aretz. Who's responsible for the lechem? Adam was cursed. Bezeas apecha tochal lechem. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow. So Samson Raphael Hirsch. Lechem from the word milchama, to battle. Bread. Why is bread in the Torah all the time? A meal is defined by bread. Bread. What's the bracha you make on bread? Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Bread is simply wheat. You take a stalk of wheat, it's a bore pri ha'adama. It grows from the ground, like carrots are a bore pri ha'adama. Thank you, God, for creating the fruits of the earth. And tomatoes are bore pri ha'adama. It grows from the ground, right? It's not a tree. It's not an age. It's an adama. Wheat is bore pri ha'adama. You're taking wheat and it's a bore pri ha'adama. Why is this wheat mozi lechem min ha'aretz? Because man had to take the wheat, grind it, process it, do stuff with it, turn it around, and turn it into something greater. Wheat's wonderful, but it ain't going to keep you going. Bread is a staple. Can't go without bread. Bread only exists because of milchama, because of a battle. We have to battle the forces of nature, and we have to form and shape it and structure it and do something with it, and it becomes lechem, and therefore it gets a higher blessing, and it becomes a motzi lechem min ha'aretz. Wine. Wine are grapes. Grapes. It's not bore priya guffin. When you eat a grape, you don't make a bore priya guffin. The fruit of the vine. Grapes are a fruit, like any other fruit. You take oranges and you turn into orange juice, you don't make a fancier bracha. If anything, it goes down a blessing because it's only considered it's not the main part of the fruit. Grapes go up in blessing. It turns it into wine and becomes bore priya guffin. It raises the level because, once again, you had to take the grape and turn it into something, and you turned it into something greater than it was when it started. The only things that go on the altar besides animals is bread and wine, wine libations, and, funny enough, oil. Right? Oil. Olive oil doesn't have a special blessing because you don't eat it. You can dip your bread into it, but you don't drink it or eat it. It doesn't have a special blessing, but it's the same idea. You take an olive, a bitter olive, and you crush it, and you turn it, and you process it, and it becomes into olive oil. So where does olive oil come in on Shabbat? We're missing olive oil. That's where the custom comes from that really, most preferably, when you light your Shabbat candles, what should you use? You should use olive oil, preferably. It fell out of disuse because olive oil was extremely expensive, and therefore uh, communities, uh, where the, the, the rabbis of communities, when it was expensive, really sort of like said, it's not so important, it's not so important, don't drive, like, don't blow your, you know, your life savings on it, because olive oil was at one time, you know, and certainly depending on where Jews were living, like Siberia, right? Uh, it was really hard to come by, but really, 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 you go back to the sources, theoretically, if it's not, you know, break of the bank, if it's not too difficult, if you, if you had a choice, it really would be your preferred choice, and it's making a big comeback. Uh, it's making a big comeback now, now that olive oil is, 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 is much easier to, to, to come to. So those are put on the altar, because it symbolizes man's conquering of nature. So man provides the structure. He goes out and he battles and he creates the structure. He has the bread, he has the wine, and he's taking the material world and he's turning it around into something edible and something greater than it was. But that only works if he has the heart of the Yeshav Chayel. But the heart and the trust of the Yeshav Chayel needs a structure within to work. You can't just la di da, you know, fump around, it's all very beautiful, and sit on the top of a mountaintop and just stare into space. No. Judaism demands structure and, 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 and connecting the the concept, the heart, within the material world. 
So we have Eishes Chayel, and then we take the wheat, which we've turned into lechem, after al Milchama, our battle with nature, and we've elevated it. We take the grapes, which we've elevated into wine, and we turn that into the beginning of a, that's how we start our meal, which is sitting down and eating a meal. The meal now has structure, because our material world has been formed and shaped, and it has heart and meaning, because the woman has put the heart into it. But let's take it a little deeper. What was the first, what was the, what was the bread that the Jews ate? They ate mun. Why do we have two chalos Friday night? Because double mun fell on Friday, right? Because no one, they weren't going to go collect mun on Shabbat. So that's when we have Lechem Mishnah, double bread Friday night, because double mun fell. Lechem min hashamayim. Great debate, by the way, what blessing did they make on mun? One opinion is they made hamotzi lechem min hashamayim, because they didn't conquer the material world. They just picked it up. So it just came from heaven. It's one opinion. All right? Great debate what bracha they made on mun. I mean, it's a theoretical debate. Listen to what the rabbis tell us. Lo nitna Torah elo la ochle hamun. Torah is only given to those that eat mun. So some of the people say what it meant was the Torah was given to the generation in the desert who ate mun. But that seems a little silly. That's just a historical fact which everybody knows. You know that in the desert the Jews had no food and they ate mun. So when God appeared at Mount Sinai, what were the Jews eating? Those people, they were eating mun. So why would the Talmud bother to make that comment? It's like, uh, by the way, you know, the people that got the Torah, they, they had mun to eat. Yeah, like, okay, so what? All right? So the, the deeper commentaries say that what the rabbis are really alluding to is Torah cannot be successful. Torah is not given to, pe- to people unless they're mun eaters. The food that you're eating is mun. Samson Matthew Hirsch points out a funny anomaly with the mun. When the mun fell, they had a command to go out and collect it. Right? They were obligated to collect one omer, a certain measure, a pound, whatever it was, an omer, Right? For every person in the household. Right? And the Torah says that they will go out to collect the mun. Right? Echad marba the echad amamid. Whoever, some collected more, some collected less. But when they got back home and they measured, they noticed a miracle that no matter how much or how little you collected, in your basket was exactly one omer per person. So ask Samson Raphael Hirsch, that seems a little silly. If God's going to do a miracle that everyone in their house is going to end up with exactly one omer per person, so they have to go bother collecting for it. Let God just make it enter into their house. It's, it's, it's miracle bread coming from heaven anyways. It could have fallen anywhere, for God's sakes. And if they have to go out and collect it, so why does, why does God make a miracle? What kind of a useless miracle is that? Like, people collect exactly, and if they came home, if they had too much, they'd put it back or go to their neighbor and say, oh, you have too little. Why why God do that? Said, says to him, Shemot Fall Hirsch, because it was to teach us a lesson. You cannot sit down and rely on miracles. Ain't so chinalanes. We don't rely on miracles. You could run into the middle of Lawrence and Bathurst at 5 o'clock in the evening, blindfolded, and you could end up not getting run over by a car. God could do that. God could split the sea. God could have you dancing around the middle of the 401 highway at four o'clock, at 5 o'clock, blindfolded, and just run back and forth and could make all the cars miss you. God could do that, but that would take an overt miracle. And therefore, you're not allowed to rely on miracles. So we don't cross the street blindfolded at 5 o'clock in rush hour. That would take a miracle. Well, God will protect me. God could, but we don't rely on miracles. You can't do things where it would take a miracle to stay alive, right? Total aside, interesting, when, many years ago when my, um, uh, my oldest boy was uh, married and living in Eretz Israel, so we went to visit, and uh, it was like a little t- t- tricky. You know, there's different times in Israel and things are quieter, and it was not one of the more quiet times. And we wanted to go to, 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 to Hebron. To Morsa Machpela, but it's still, still a dangerous place. So his wife was a little nervous. You know, maybe we shouldn't go. You know, it, you know it's dangerous. You can't put yourself in danger, right? And I said, listen, you go ask your Rosh Hashiva. Whatever, for all Shmuel Levitz, that Saul was still alive. That was his like, Go ask him for all Levitz and ask him. You know, you're right. Can't put yourself in danger. It's time. Don't go dangerous things for dangerous things. So he said like this. He said, 
You're not allowed. It says it doesn't. It never says you can't. We, things are dangerous. Flying is dangerous. Things are dangerous. You got to do what is normal. You can't rely on miracles. It said if the Israeli army would close a road and say we're not letting people go to Hebron now, it's too dangerous, and you would go anyways. That's relying on miracles. The army said it's too dangerous, and then it's dangerous, right? And they said please don't go. So then you don't go. I God could do a miracle. Of course he could do a miracle. But we don't rely on miracles. But if the army's letting people go, notwithstanding that obviously it's a shtickle danger, but they think it's safe enough that it's okay to do, then you're not relying on miracles. That's that's the natural way of the world and go. That's how we we don't rely on miracles. Okay? So you gotta go out and collect the money. You got to go out and work for a living. You can't sit and twiddle your thumbs and God will have money come down from heaven. You got to have a plan. You buy life insurance. You put money away. You invest. You do what you got to do. You bicycle. Yeah, you could smoke 20 packs of cigarettes a day and not get lung cancer. God could do a miracle, but you don't. You, you, you exercise and you eat healthy and you go to your doctor twice a year or whatever it is and, 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 and you, you try and get a normal job and, and, and you plan your finances because you can't rely on miracles. But you'll never make more money than God wanted you to make. Doesn't matter how, mo- how what happens. You go out, you collect. Collect a lot. You'll have exactly one omer per person. You collect the minimum. Okay, you go out, you collect a little bit because you got to collect one omer per person. Don't think that by working yourself to a bone, never coming home to be do homework with your kids, fudging the uh, laws of honesty in your business, and working on Shabbat when God said you're not supposed to, don't think you're going to make more money by working the system. You're not going to make more money by making God unhappy. You'll make more money by making God happy. But you can't rely on miracles. you got to do something. That's the power of the mud. Torah was given to the people that eat mud. Mem nun. Forty and 50 is 90. That's MS. That's truth. To people who understand what the real truth is. The truth is, you do have to work. But the truth is, you'll never have more than God wants you to have. You'll never have less than God wants you to have. That's the power of the mud. That's Shabbat. We don't go to work on Shabbat. If you don't come in on Saturday... Don't bother to come in on Monday. What was going on in the 1910s and 1920s in North America, 1930s? So there are people who would have services at 6.30 Shabbat morning so they could be done by 8.30 so they could get to work. We don't judge. Don't know what I would have done in that situation myself, 100%. But that theologically makes no sense. How are you going to make more money by upsetting the good Lord? That's the whole point of Shabbat. The whole point of the mud was go to work, go out and collect it, but you're only going to have what God has. Shabbat is taking the material world and conquering it. The Esh of Chayil, Tishrak Leo Machro. We laugh at the material world because it's leading for, to a greater rebirth. The material world on Shabbat, you get an extra neshama, you're reborn on, 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 on Shabbat with a bigger and greater soul. Right? That's the power of Shabbat. So there's the heart, the emunah, the faith that the material world is darkest before dawn and there's a world to come out there, right? And that's what Shabbat's all about. But it's not up on the mountaintop and just dancing in the hills with no structure and out of touch with the reality of the world. There's bread and there's wine, which is a material world which mankind works with turns it around, battles with it, and turns it into something greater, raises its status as far as the blessing that's made on it, raises its status that it's put on the altar, raises its status, and that's how you start your meal. So your meal has structure, understanding of the material world, where, in the, where the material world is going, but with that heart, with that emunah of Eishas Chayil. And how do we bring Shabbat to a close? Mincha. Then the service is beginning to get dark. We're beginning to lose our Shabbat and go into the work week. We said that in Mincha we talk about Ata Echad, Veshimcha Echad, Mikam Yisrael Goyecha Baaretz, Teferes Kedula, Teres Menucha. We talk about talking about the days of Mashiach. 
We discuss the idea of Mashiach. Funny enough, where does Mashiach come into this? Because the times of Mashiach are described as Yom Shekulo Shabbat. They will be days that it will be, every day will be Shabbat. Because then the truth will be seen. We will not have the nations of the world driving us crazy. Truth will be obvious. And we will be able to see the material world for what it is, which is just merely an opportunity for us to put our imprint on it. And that battle will be so much easier. It's Yom Shekulo Shabbat. So let's take it a little deeper. It says Rabbi Dessler, who died in the 1950s, he said, based on sources, what's going to be the final struggle in the end of days? In the end of days, the Nikvah said the Mashiach, as we get closer to the time of Mashiach, what's going to be the final struggle? It says Rabbi Dessler, the final struggle is going to be this work week Shabbat struggle, which was where creation started with. He said, we just, he was, he, he was talking in the 1950s, early 1950s. He said, we went through a Holocaust. The Holocaust was a struggle of we were totally helpless. We were helpless. There was nothing we could do. The nation's world couldn't give a hoot. We had no political power. It took us out from the, so a little bit of war. So get, but basically, we, 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 there was very little the Jewish people as a whole could do to solve their Problems. Individuals here and there did the best they could, but the nation as a whole was basically pretty helpless. And we just had to just accept it and just pray for the best. That's all we could do. It's okay, God got to carry us through this. After the Holocaust comes the final struggle, which is the flip to the opposite extreme. The, the, the struggle of thinking that my strength and my power will totally protect me. Look at where we are now. We have our own country, and we have our own army, and we have our own secret service, and we have tons of money, and we're politically connected, and uh, we have Nobel Prize winners, and we have Jewish politicians, and we have uh, Jewish, we have political connections, and, and we're connected to a lot of people, and we're, 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 we're money. We've never been seemingly so in control being able to take care of ourselves so much, you know, power in, in the history of the Jewish people. Get, get King Solomon, but in, in the relatively modern history of the Jewish people, our own country, our own army, the government, right? We had secret service all over the place, and we, we had iron domes, and we got Jewish scientists and Jewish money. Remember, boys, you know, remember, I always said if I, if I wasn't Jewish, I'd be an anti-Semite. We are all over the place. We do control everything, for God's sakes, right? We are everywhere. Tremendous power, political clout, connections. It's the struggle of, but in the end, God controls. You have to do what you got to do. You can't rely on miracles. And if you can, if you, thank God, have the ability to create an army then obviously you should, right? And if you have the ability to make political connections to try and influence politicians, then you don't just sit in a corner and twiddle your thumbs and hope for the best. You make the phone call, you go talk to them, you use your voting power, you got to do what you got to do, just like you can't twiddle your thumbs and wait for food to come from heaven. We don't do that. We go to work, we, we, we exercise, right? We eat healthy. But in the end, who controls it all? The good Lord controls it all. That's the final battle before Mashiach comes. That battle of, we have tremendous material world. We got a lot of that number six, right? We're in the final, we're in the six thousand, the end of the six thousand year before the seventh thousand. We're right before Shabbat. And right before Shabbat is the most hectic time of the day. You're rushing to the candles ready, you're rushing to the food ready, you're rushing to the you got to wash your time, take a shower, answer your last emails, you know, send out a couple of texts, check your phone one more time before you turn it off, write in time to get everything done. It's a really busy time because you're trying to get as much material world as you can before. But then God's going to control it. So I now stop. And all stops. Because the end result is going to be the good Lord. I can't rely on miracles, and I, I work up to two, 20 seconds before candle lighting. But in the end, whatever I'm going to have is what God decides. And that's, that's Ikvis and the Mashiach. That's our final goal is now of using the resources the good Lord has given us, but realize in the end, it's all going to go his way. 
And since it's all going to go his way, you got to do Shabbat his way. And that'll be the con- con- concept, the topic of next week, right? In which we'll discuss this idea of, you know, the spirit of Shabbat is very beautiful, but the laws of Shabbat seem to really get you down. How do you mix it and match it and, 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 and put it together? Let me just end with one small idea, then we'll take all the questions that you want. Somebody once pointed out, when we start Shabbat, we light Shabbat candles, right? Two Shabbat candles, two separate candles. Sachor v'shamor, right? People of a custom, if you have children, you light for every year one of your children, but the key is to light two Shabbat candles, right? When we end Shabbat, we also end with a fire, right? We make Havdalah. The law of Havdalah is it cannot be a single wick. It has to be an avuka. It has to be a torch. It has to be more than one wick twisted together or, 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 or connected. So you have these Havdalah candles that have a whole bunch coming up, or even these fancy ones, but if you look carefully, it it's two wicks, and, that, and it can't be two separate flakes. Right? Even if it's two wicks, or you have your Abdullah candle, each one's a little flame, you can see people will like bend it over because it has to go into one unified flame. Because that's the power of Shabbat. When you start Shabbat and you just start, you're, everyone's their own person. I'm doing my work, you're doing your work. The husband is putting in his structure and concept to, to, to the home, the woman's putting in the heart and, and the emun and the trustworthiness and sensitivity into the home. Every home is doing its own little thing. The power of Shabbat, when you sit back and you realize that as much as I'm doing, the end result's really all based on the good Lord, gives you the ability for very different people to end up getting along. And those two candles become one. The husband and wife complement each other because they realize each role is important. All Jewish homes can complement each other and realize they're all important. What were the 12 tribes? Twelve tribes each had their own flag, their own different colored stone on the on the priestly, on the choshen, on the breastplate. When they crossed the Yamsuf, when they crossed the river, when God split the sea, notwithstanding the movie, the rabbis tell us that it was really twelve paths. They each went through their own path. They were clear walls separating and they could see, because everybody has their own path. But it's one unified whole. We could all work together. The power of Shabbat is when you put everything in the right perspective, no one's competing against anybody else. No one else is going to take away what the good Lord wants you to have, right? And and whatever they have is because the good Lord wants them to have it. Whatever you have is because the good Lord wants That's what you're supposed to have. And and, and, and and need the heart and the feeling, but it has to be within structure. But you need structure, but it needs to have content. And you put the two candles together in Yen Shabbat with a beautiful flame, which leads you into the next